All right, folks. So we have finally in the story of Exodus, we have left Egypt. We have wandered in the desert for a little bit, but now we are approaching Mount Sinai. So uh, I hope you can feel the tension building in this chapter. Um, I'm curious what your all's initial thoughts of kind of approaching the mountain is this morning. You got strict uh, instructions not to approach the mountain. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could you feel the rumbling of anticipation as the story built? <laughs> you know, my reaction was is that, that they, it's all, it's kind of negative. Uh, uh, God is still doing his thing, you know, testing and and saying that if you touch the bottom of the mountain, you're going to die. I mean, it's it's not, it's a very unfriendly uh, <laughs> uh, So I I didn't know that. I didn't. I. <laughs> oh, we'll I talk. A, so thanks for bringing that up. Or it's why I'm kind of trying to get some impressions from you all. The unfriendliness. There is a reason. I know. And it deals with the ancient mindset. So we'll dig into that a little bit. Any other initial? Yeah, Larry. It almost reminded me of the Wizard of Oz. God <laughs> was going to appear in a big cloud. There are going to be loud trumpets blaring, you know. Uh -huh. It's going to be quite an extravaganza. Right. Mm -hmm. All the pomp and circumstance, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, find, I found just through the whole chapter, it was very interesting um, how the Lord spoke. Um, you know, in, in is it verse 8, um, everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So there's no direct conversation there. And um, the Lord said to Moses, he's going to come in this dense cloud. So the people will trust you ever after. And then it goes later where um, uh, 21 on down, where all of a sudden the Lord is speaking in the third person um, where the Lord says to Moses, and then the Lord says, the Lord will break out against them. Um, and he speaks of himself in the third person, which, um, yeah, just, I just found all of that, the whole communication issue, interesting. Mm hmm Right. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit of those details of, like, or is it a problem of like transcribing what's being said or is it sources or is it like God talking in a weird way? <laughs> All right. We don't know. Do we? <laughs> well, there's a few theories, but yeah. <laughs> so let's jump in. Um, so we've had a, we've had about We've had two trials of water, one trial of food, and fight a little bit of instructions of how to do leadership, and now they are officially at the mountain of God. The assumption is that this mountain is the same as Horeb, where Moses encountered the bur burning bush. That's a, a general assumption. That's not necessarily proven in the text. But the one thing, because this is once again where... There is a definite location, and so people for ages have been trying to find, like, where is the actual Mount Sinai? And so let's start off with a little bit of location. I'll put it out there first and foremost. We don't actually know where the actual Mount Sinai is. <laughs> if you go to the Sinai Peninsula, trust me, there's about five locations that will title itself, Travel to the Real Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So I drew I drew up some maps just to kind of orient ourselves and um, uh, a few of them are super helpful, but I was trying to find some with topography because the topography of the area matters. So this kind of puts us in context of the rest of the story where they started up in Egypt over here. The crossing of the Red Sea is often put in this kind of narrower space. So it's not like they're crossing the thick of it, but just this little part right here. 
and we know that they have traveled downward. And if you can see a little bit here, what you will see is it kind of has a shadow of being mountainous. And now let me, I need to switch between tabs here. Give me a moment. Um, ah, good. That helped. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Can you all see the new picture? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So this one is a satellite image and you can see a better idea that this whole place is mountainous. So the top of the Sinai Peninsula is rather flat. Um, it's more of like a plain, but because this is where tectonic plates are pushing and pulling, this area right here is very mountainous. So we know that they are in the south of the Sinai Peninsula, and there's about five really tall peaks that are proponents of being Mount Sinai. When looking up images, I did find a few, and I think this comes or this is, from what we know, this is not accurate, but it is interesting. That's, I think this map is going with the idea too that the um, the Sy Mount Sinai is actually on the Arabian Peninsula. <laughs> There's reasons why people would say that. It is not. Um, it is most likely in the southern, southern area over here. But let me do a little bit of finagling again to get the last picture. As a more black and white, map without the topography we see that there's some rivers and everything up here which is in the plains area but they think that the mount sinai mount horeb is here in the very south so you can kind of see the crossing they will eventually go up then back down and then the kind of the back route uh because they will eventually end up on the east side of the jordan so with that in mind, we don't know where the actual location is, but that's how far they've actually already traveled is from basically the top of the Sinai Peninsula down to the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. And what we do know is there is a tall mountain and there's a place, there's like a valley area before you get to the mountain where the people are currently staying. So does that kind of give a better image of where they are more yeah. or less? Yeah, Mary Ellen? Well, it, you know, in combination with that, just verse one, um, on the third new moon after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt. Um, I like the way that they track time. You know, that's the first I've seen of something like that. But they actually weren't moving that slowly. That's a long way to go when you're um, walking and taking carts and flocks and all the rest of it that... Um, you know, I thought it would have taken them six months to get that far, not three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Larry. I guess it, what, 50 days is about what, you know, three new moons would be. So that's, that isn't a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. One of the ostensible locations is a place called St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, where there's a huge monastery built at supposedly Mount Horeb. In 1996, Jean and I visited there, and we climbed that mountain. Uh, for fun, I pulled the pictures I took out of the book, and I'll, I'll bring them to church if anybody wants to look at them. It was an interesting uh, experience. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Has anyone else been to that area at all? Mm -hmm. I, I went a year ago, but I don't think our trip took us down there. Okay. Because so I've been around Israel and Palestine, but we, we never made the trip to uh, Sinai. So um, there's a few other things on the Sinai Peninsula that I hear are cool, but okay, awesome. Well, I'll, I'll be curious to see those, Larry. Okay, I'll bring them Sunday. Oh, you find there. Wait. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We're trying to find greeters. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. I won't be there. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they're camping in front of the mountain. They've had a long journey, and now Moses, in his like his divine mediator role, goes up the mountain and talks with God, and God 
lays out kind of what what's going to happen in the little time in the time to come. So in verse three, uh, it starts, the Lord called him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, tell the Israelites, you have seen what I've done to the Egyptians and how I bore you up on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, obey my voice keep my covenant and you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So what do you think of this setup? Yeah, Clay. Well, um, the, uh, I have the, um, you know, college edition of the Oxford uh, Bible. And in the notes, it says, my own possession or treasure is a metaphor for Israel's special relationship to God. In freedom and grace, he chose this people to be his own. Mm -hmm. So it, that, that puts it into a little different context than your mind. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, Mary Ellen? Well, it also... Um... It has the Israelites look in a more global position of this God that um, he is saying the whole earth is mine, but you will be this separate treasured part of it. Um, I think it would be very normal for people to think that it was just uh, themselves in that situation with Moses connecting to God, obeying God's rules, covenants, whatever, that it's a very localized then I don't see them thinking beyond themselves and their situation. And so now God has presented this to them that over the Canaanites, over everybody, he is, the earth is mine, depending on whether the Midians are there or whoever, it is all mine, but I'm separating you out as, um, a pre the priestly kingdom and a holy nation and it, it just putting a more um global aspect on it not only for them but also for the rest of us um to keep this in mind mm -hmm. yeah so whatever or putting it in that global expect in that global view so like what are the kind of expectations for israel and like, how is the rest of the world supposed to relate to God then? So God's saying they're all in second place or third or beyond that yeah. nobody else is going to get to be um, the holy nation. He's already declared, you know, these people. So everybody else comes in after them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, didn't Christians kind of, at least the Christians that came to this country, thought they were included. Uh, they thought that this promise passed from the Jewish people to the Christians. That is called uh, supersessionism and is yeah. generally frowned upon these days. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> saying that we inherited it, therefore you don't have this status anymore, only we do. Ooh. Oh. Oh, 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 I don't like that at all. <laughs> no that is so christian supersessionism if you accuse someone of that that's kind of a, a an insult it's considered a like a slanderous thing to say but it's while like people know that you're not supposed to do this it's interesting how it kind of remains in a lot of our the language and theology of christianity you see it a lot in paul and it's one of the reasons i don't like paul is Paul's kind of like the Jewish people, they didn't hear the promise. We took on the promise. We're the next step. We kind of superseded oh, I, them. I didn't realize that that the Jews were that, that were, yeah, I didn't know about superset. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. I thought it was an included kind of thing. Nope. <laughs> yeah, Larry. If you take it literally, that the Jewish people are actually the chosen people of God. Yeah. Then you've got to worry about how's the rest of the world going to relate to them? Mm -hmm. I mean, are they going to buy into that? Yeah, you you people, you're the 
special sort of people. The rest of us are just, you know, just living here off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we see some, I, the way I would think or try to understand this is there's a bit that actually goes back to Abraham and what God said to Abraham, but there's a little bit where you see patterns repeated in like bigger and bigger scales. And so going back to Abraham and what God said initially in the covenant with Abraham is you, Abraham, are blessed in order to be a blessing. That you are like a special person that I'm making a relationship with, but it is so that I can have relationships with the rest of the world. I'm going to bless you and you are going to be this conduit of blessing for other people. This in this is not dissimilar to this or to what is kind of being set up here is if Israel is being set up as a priestly nation, that means that the rest of the world is being is like seeking guidance and leadership to the priests. And so Israel is the leader of the nations is another way to think of it in the way that Moses communicates to God and then like he is the conduit to God to the people. The people are then supposed to be the conduit of God to the rest of the world. Mm. So it's in the, or we were talking about last time of, okay, Moses, you are the leader, but you need to set up a tiered leadership underneath you. Right. That actually may be why it's out of place and hits before this is because it helps the people understand that, yes, they have this elevated status, but it's not to gloat. Like, there's responsibility. They are to be the priests for the world. Okay. So does that orient it a little bit different instead of being like, this is my favorite object that I'm going to put on the shelf, but more... I am elevating your status to be of service to the world. Mm -hmm. But this might be a source of anti-Semitic thinking. Hmm? Say more. Well, I'm just, you know, uh, wondering if, in fact, there are people who, who follow that uh, line of thought. You know, it has always seemed to me the animosity against uh, the Jews in the world was more due to their great success uh, in banking and, and, and what have you, rather than on a religious basis. I've never heard it expressed really that I've been aware of on the basis of anything that was in the Bible or so forth. Well, it has to do, also to do with the belief that the Jews were uh, involved in the killing of Jesus. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the political and the religious go in tandem together. So the verse that we talked about on Sunday, um, the the Deuteronomy verse that says like you forgive the debts for your own people. There, I didn't touch on it really because it takes a long. Uh, it would take longer than the time I had to explain, but it says, you don't have to forgive the debts of foreign people. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that it is in the scripture is it's, there's other points where it says, don't uh, lend money to your own people. Don't take on debts. Don't do usury for your people, but you can do usury for other people. And this is how the Jewish people um, historically ended up in the banking sector is because they weren't allowed to buy land like the Christian nations forbid them from owning land but Christian people didn't lend money to other Christian people by and large Jewish folk did not lend money to Jewish folk but between the communities you could lend money and so they like they set up or the Christian ruler set up a situation where there's a group of people who are not allowed to buy land, but they can give out loans. And that's actually how they ended up in that sector is because they were kind of backed into it. Mm. 
So mm -hmm. it's Christian leaders' fault that the Jewish people kind of ended up there. Like, anyways, bringing it back around from that uh, note, um, it is not, or how do I want to say this? This still does play a role in politics today, though. I mean, I don't want to ignore the fact that um, there is like a really big uh, conflict going on between Israel and Hamas, which affects all of the Palestinian people. And one of the aspects of it is they are still evoking the fact that they have special status. Um, and this kind of relationship that they are, are the religious side of it is like, they are saying like, we are like, this group of people, this um, with this special status, and you're not allowing us to kind of live into the promises of God. And it gets muddled with a bunch of other things, but it does come into play that we are God's uh, chosen favorite people. Hmm. And so I'm not going to ignore that, like, this still is at play and gets thrown around in different ways, sometimes mm -hmm. honestly and sometimes dishonestly. But in the end, it's um, bringing it to kind of more to the local level of what the people would be hearing. What do you think the people who are at the foot of Sinai are thinking when they are hearing mm -hmm. you are to be a priestly nation? <laughs> what kind of expectations are you hearing as you're being told to, that like okay you're going to interact with this god you're going to have special status but you are going to be this special priestly nation mm, sounds like a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> yeah if they actually but, if they do mm -hmm. it but they were sort of led to believe that you know it, that if they followed God, they were going to end up in the promised land. Okay. So they, they've got expectations of, uh, you know, really coming out of this doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they've been told that a lot, uh, yeah, but what, they were in the promised land a long time before, before they were exiled in, in Egypt. So mm -hmm. yeah. kind of weird. Mm -hmm. weren't they were they actually there uh, I, I thought they were uh well you have the the holy family was in the land but remember they only really bought a few plots of land and that was to bury people oh. so they haven't owned it no mm -hmm. or they've owned small pieces of it okay So from this point, so that was kind of the introduction. We're we're gonna make a covenant. You're gonna be my special people, and you have you're gonna have responsibilities here. So now summon the people forward, and the Lord says to Moses, "I'm going to descend in a dense cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you, so that they will trust you forever after." All right, question. Yeah. How can the people hear what the Lord says to Moses? Mm -hmm. There's no communication established between the people and God. It all goes through Moses or Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, and so this how the people may hear when I speak with you. Is this the wind in the cloud? Is it, I mean, how is this more impressive than all the things that um, he did to the Egyptians, all of the plagues, the whatever, how is a dense cloud supposed to be so impressive that um, the communication through the cloud, through God, through Moses, that, the people will trust you forever after. I'll get it. So great segue into the next big concept that I think is important to understand, to understand what's going to happen. So this is, this part 
is understanding or going way back to Genesis. You remember the first creation story where there's the dome and then like the heavens above the dome. The assumption here is that God is above the dome and Mount Sinai is a high enough place. So it's almost like God is stepping down and like entering the earthly plane here. The There is an ancient assumption though, and this goes into why the people have to be consecrated, why they can only go to a certain place. The assumption of the ancient world is if you saw the face of God, you would die because God is pure and that humans are impure. And so when those two things meet, um, like Indiana Jones and like, or the, and the, where they're like opening the Ark of the Covenant and everyone's face melts off. That's actually not too far off of what some of the ancient assumptions were, is that like, if you saw God, like your impurities would burn away, but we're so human that we would basically just like melt or we would be blown away. It's, there is the part where there's a little bit more description, but it's basically that God is so holy and pure that our humanness basically cannot stand it that um it has like a radiation effect and we would die and so the cloud kind of disguises that holiness and so when god is stepping down there it is like in the cloud so god basically doesn't irradiate the people this comes into play in different points because Moses has a weird special status where evidently Moses can look at God. Yeah. This comes into play a few times. Uh, mm -hmm. There's actually a whole thing about Moses's face glowing. Um, so Moses seems to be able to tolerate like the holiness of God. And some of this isn't assumed to be like within God's control it's not like god is causing this to happen it is thought that this is a part of god god being a god and like the godliness of divinity just means that impurities will be blown away and humans will die it's not i will cause them to die it's just this the proximity will cause this to happen mm -hmm. the other thing to note is that this is painting uh, the Israelites God in a very similar light to the Canaanite storm God. We talked about this previously, how um, they think a lot of religion stemmed from like a central belief. And as the people moved out over millennia, they kind of brought some assumptions with them. Mm -hmm. Yahweh in some ways very much still operates as a storm God, as a sky God, as a God up there. I mean, even the fact that like God seems to be stepping down from the heavens to the human plane, but that it's in a, in a dense cloud and God thunders and there's lightning and the earth is shaking. We see all of these elements in Ugaritic transcripts of Canaanite uh, beliefs about their gods. And so God is operating in somewhat a known <laughs> trope of this storm God. So that's where some of these elements come into play as well. And he also wants to, or the, the God wants to show the people that he, that he really does have a connection with Moses. He wants to, to see, for them to see. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Yeah. So, oh, back to part of the question, how are people hearing this? It is actually partially thought to be in the thunder and the lightning that like God's voice is thunderous. And so the thunder is kind of God's auditory speaking. And so you could see like Moses saying something and then the sky thundering and then Moses responding and the sky thundering. And it's thought to be that the God's voice is somewhere in that. <laughs> so does that give you all an even like clearer mental image of kind of the whole situation going on? And who's who's playing the trumpets? Oh, so it is thought that there is heaven, the heavenly. I I didn't see this in the notes, but my assumption is that the heavenly host is coming with God. 
So mm -hmm. in the next section, it talks about anyone who touches the mountain will be put to death. No hand shall touch them, but they shall be stoned or shot with arrows. That sounds like the company is coming, like the angels and everything are coming with God. And so there's like guards or angels or protectors that are like protecting God as people approach, which also means the horns would be like, if you think about like a king approaching and there's like the trumpet players that like are announcing the king as he walks along. I actually have one of them. The probably the thing that they are they are not thinking like a brass trumpet like we nor like the instrument we think of. Uh, this is a very small one, but this is the shofar. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a ram's horn. I got this one from my grandparents. They got a fancy one with metal on it. Um, but most of the time it's just a horn from a ram. And sometimes they like that one's actually a pocket sized one because they get to be a full huge like size I think a lot of you have seen these and you blow into them and they have that blasty sound so less in like the western like very brassy sound and it's a little bit more earthy um but it's the ram's horn is probably what they're imagining and the shofar has a like a specific order to be blown that I I've heard explained and I always forget it so you can all there is an explanation, but that's likely what they're talking about with trumpets are this is the blast of the shofar to kind of announce God's presence and the approach. So you can kind of see how this matches in some way human kings and how people would approach human kings or what would happen when a human king approached the people. So but part of this is that the people have to prepare themselves. And so God commands them that you need to consecrate the people today. They need to wash. They need to get ready. So part of this is like that, get ready for the king to approach, get ready for God to approach. But there's also this sense of purity, of not of ritual purity, which is also connected with um like actual cleanliness practices. We don't yet have the formula of how to be consecrated. That comes later, but they are being told <laughs> clean yourself to consecrate yourself likely has some like words to be said with anointing with oil. And they are supposed to do this in order for God to approach at all. So the instructions are consecrate yourself, become like, that's literally what priests do. And the whole, all the people are told to consecrate yourself because you are going to be a priestly nation, wash your clothes, wash your bodies, and then don't step on the mountain because if you do, you're going to basically be obliterated. So what do you think, any thoughts on this of having to have the entire company of people prepare themselves as if they were priests about to do a holy ritual, about to go before God? Yeah. <laughs> Is this why we always wear our best clothes to church? Mm -hmm. That's yes, what I was... it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Mary Ellen, though? So I was just going to say, you know, me, I, I'm down on their level a lot of the times thinking, where's all this water coming from? Um, you know, they've been thirsty. They've been after Moses to give them water. They're dying, whatever. And all of a sudden, the entire company will have enough water to wash their clothes, which takes a lot of water. So, you know, I'm lost in some of the sticks here. That's just a side thought. Um <clears throat> I think the command is interesting considering um, the circumstances of the people's current lives. So they they will they will have had to find a water source because they're gonna stay here for a few months. Like it's gonna take a while. They are going to stay here until I think they leave in towards the end of numbers. So the rest of Exodus, all of Leviticus and Numbers, Moses is like running up and down the mountain and the people are staying where they are. So they're just by context clues, there is a water source. Okay. But you are, Gary, I see your hand. 
just a moment. Um, one of the things that is, I think, helps give a little bit of texture to it of the people are really dirty and gross right now. Like they've been traveling in the desert. They found like just enough water to drink. They stink. They have grime on them. They know it. So yeah, wash yourself and get ready to see God. Like that actually is kind of important. <laughs> but Gary, what were you thinking? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if it was true back in these days, but today when we have this heavy thunder and lightning, we usually get a downpour. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although it's not stated, it's, it seems that a heavy rain seems to go with uh, that such type of condition. Hmm. Yeah, that is actually, huh. It says it, or a quick Google says it rains about eight days a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, Larry? The place we were in Sinai, there's been a monastery there, I think since 74 AD or something or other like that. So people uh, with hundreds of mon monks there. So people have been living there, you know, in the middle of the desert. And if you drill down far enough, I guess maybe you reach water because obviously they've had a supply of water for mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah, I mean, so one of the, one of the aspects of, I mean, they are in a desert area However, mountains do have a habit of collecting uh, moisture because of altitude. And so there are some streams, Or because I was looking at one of the maps, there are streams that flow into a river that do flow off of the mountains. So there, there is some kind of water here, mm -hmm. but it's probably still not a lot. <laughs> They in when they were in Egypt, I'm thinking about when Joseph was in Egypt, wasn't there a scene where he had to get washed and cleaned up? I forgot what, what it did. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly, but I remember at another time that that was part of meeting his family or something. I can't remember the part it, it was. was when he was being taken out of prison to see the Pharaoh. Yeah. Right, they took right. him out of prison, they washed him up, they dressed him up. Yeah, 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 and got okay. him presentable to see the king slash okay. human god. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's curious to me. Uh, Ameri American culture, as of recently, has become a very casual culture, mm -hmm. and <laughs> I feel like the notion of like dressing up in your finest is increasingly rare. Um, it's surprising to me when I go to like a really nice restaurant and there's inevitably like one young man there with his date that still has like a baseball cap on and I'm like serious we're like a four-star <laughs> restaurant here <laughs> and so I'm curious about what your all sense is if there if we still have anything in our culture that we feel like yes we really need to dress up and look our best I mean we don't consecrate ourselves in the same way, but we still like do our hair. Sometimes we maybe put a little bit of perfume on if we're feeling fancy. Is there anything that still holds that status? It's we're losing it. Um, I was looking at the reception pictures um, of a wedding um, recently, and I was amazed at the time I was looking at the pictures at how casually the men were dressed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, almost they could be doing yard work, you know, in, in my mind, they, you know, cleaner than doing yard work. But um, the men were so casually dressed that I, I, you're at a wedding reception. You're indoors seated at a table. What, you know, so we're <laughs> listening to what you're talking about. There's no, um, no, no dress um, expectation, I guess, yeah. from younger it people. They want people to come. I think that's why they think they have to say that. The opera says in the symphony, say, you can wear anything you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Clay and then Larry? Um, I like to do afternoon tea. And I was just at the special one that's at the Boston Library. 
And I went there on an extremely rainy day. I had my clothes with me in a plastic bag. So like, because I felt I needed to change into something nice. And everyone who came in was dressed up. Um, it was quite delightful. You might not do that at the one perhaps in Rochester here. You might go a little more casually. Our group went there one time, the Grace and Aging, but I'm sure we all wore nice clothes. But this this seems to be at least a holdover maybe from other times where, and there was a grandmother there with her granddaughter and they were just all dressed up. So I think of afternoon tea at a fancy place that you're going to dress up for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's Boston. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Larry. Well, first we got casual Friday at work. Then we yeah. got Zoom. And you could, you know, you didn't even have to change out of your pajamas. You know, you could participate in your work day. So we sort of oh. funneled uh, away into more and more casual. And another thought um, is the cost of buying a suit that you're not going to wear to work. Mm -hmm. Do you buy a suit to wear to maybe a wedding that maybe might happen. So, so there's that also that perhaps you don't have that available. You might be able to get the dress pants, the shirt, and maybe the tie, but the whole suit or a sport coat just isn't uh, perhaps affordable or feasible to splurge on if you're only gonna wear it once every few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know what I'm talking about with the wedding reception pictures, plaid shirts, plaid, you know, button down shirt, kind of a collar thing or cargo pants. Um, I, you know, I just, I, well, in, in, in the presentation, my niece was a bridesmaid a couple of years back and dresses were beautiful. The girls were beautiful. Everything, the photographs were beautiful until you look at the more casual pictures and my own great niece was wearing clogs with her beautiful long bridesmaids dress and she had clogs on. Oh, well, they wear tennis shoes. You know, after the wedding, for the wedding reception, the gals slip into tennis shoes. You know, the, the casual pictures after the wedding and, you know, what clogs. <laughs> well, the shoes, the shoes, the high heel shoes hurt your feet. <laughs> yeah. Get rid of those heels, so. up, but it's not no, it's scripture. We've yeah. wandered. <laughs> no, yeah. no. So, or Larry has one more comment, but then I actually have a point for bringing this up. Yeah, Larry. I was just wondering who said, "Don't judge a book by its cover." <laughs> <laughs> right. So here's why: like, there is a dynamic pull because there's a certain point where, like. I, I understand the, the pull back and forth of like the the opera and the symphony saying, just come. And in church these days, we're in kind of a mode of like, we would rather you be here. There's a certain point of like, you don't have to dress up. You don't have to like pretend you're someone we're not. We like authenticity. And in some ways, authenticity says, come as you are when you can. <laughs> But I, so you all know me and you know that I love fashion and dressing nice. I find myself in a, like a fascinating position where my average, like how I just dress on a normal day is fancy for most people, which is funny when people are like dress up for this. And I'm like, do you want me to wear my normal clothes or do you want me to wear my fancy clothes? Because that's going to be another tier. Um, but I feel like something changes in our human psychology when we dress up. And there's a po reason why we kind of lament when it's like, it's a wedding. Can you not even like put something nice on for a wedding? And there's something special when you reserve places for, I mean, sometimes people deride dress codes as being classist and yet there is something special when you go into a tea room and everyone's dressed like they are going to see the queen. Like, what is it that changes in our human psychology when we dress up in our finery? Well, I'm not sure that everybody has a, a, a relationship to clothes that, um, I mean, I, I love clothes and you do too. So some people don't 
love clothes. So it doesn't really, it feels like a, a, a roadblock for them to have to dress up. It doesn't, yeah, it's not a good, yeah, it's. And yet, it, so like, I hear you, yes, not everyone loves fashion and dressing up. And yet, when you see people go to, like, I am fascinated by like Mark Zuckerberg, who basically only ever wears gray t-shirts, wore a suit to address Congress. Yeah. Why? Like, there is a reason why we do this. And lawyers always wear suits when they go to court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Gary? It, yeah, I, I think it has to do with uh, the respect for those that you're going to be with. It's... Mm -hmm. um, I, I and it makes me feel better. And if I am underdressed, not I, I would I'd be uncomfortable and embarrassed mm -hmm. because it's disrespectful to the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think people today think about that. They don't really care that much about the other person. So I'm just going to wear what makes me comfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I think there's also possible, so yes. And I also think that there's a sense when we wear our nice things, we know that this is a time set aside. And I think that's one of the important things about the consecration is like there is yes, the holiness aspect that like impurities can't be near God. But I think the other thing that I don't want to downplay is putting people in the headspace that this is not just another day. This is not just your normal routine. Something special is happening. And I think that's why we like weddings are a point where, yeah, mostly speaking, dress up. That is still the cultural assumption is because we acknowledge this doesn't happen every day. And I think that's why people used to do it for church more more than people do today is we are setting this side this time aside and so we want to be out of our working clothes because this is not a working space this is a different space and i know that like when i get home from work i want to be in my home space and so i take off my work clothes and it has nothing to do with the fact that like my clothes are dirty or that it's not suitable for my home but it's fascinating to me how our environment shapes our mentality. And this is like, we are going to enter this space. So get yourself ready and put yourself in the head space. We're going to spend three days getting ready to meet God. So spend the time to prepare to meet God. Get yourself in the head space. Like wash your body. Get yourself ready to meet God. So moving along, um, ooh, we still have about half the verse left and we're st we have 10 minutes to go. I think we can get there though. Um, one of the last aspects that I, uh, is a routine part of, um, of like consecration and holiness. And we see this in 15, prepare yourselves on the third day and don't go near a woman. Um, sex is, has a place. And it's not to say sex is dirty, but it has this ritual impurity. And so it's, and it's only for 24 hours. And this maintains true that we'll see it in the code that you're not supposed to go in the temple for 24 hours if you've gotten down. Um, and so that's the last thing, like no, no sex for three days. And <laughs> then we're gonna meet God. But I think that also goes into the headspace of like, Prepare yourself, mind, body, and soul. Don't be distracted by other things. You're supposed to be getting ready here. So don't be distracted, I think is why that's in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and on the morning of the third day, we start to get the rolling out of God, that there was thunder, there was lightning, there was a thick cloud on the mountain, blast of trumpets so loud that the people in the camp trembled. So this is a loud cacophony and they're seeing kind of this thing coalesce on the top of the mountain. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took 
and like they're standing at the foot of the mountain wrapped in smoke with all this thunder and lightning and the mountain shakes violently. Now we also know this area is known for seismic activity so this may also be earthquake happening but would you not be terrified if you were one of those people standing at the foot of Sinai? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be impressed. Mm -hmm. And so in 19, the trumpet blast grew louder and louder. So once again, that has the sense of like God is stepping down from heaven. God is approaching closer and closer. This is one of those where God's physicality and location matters. And so you can kind of see that approach and like the people are standing there at the foot of the mountain going, oh my goodness. And then Moses would speak to God and God would answer um, him in the thunder. So it does seem to be that Moses is having a conversation with a storm. Um, and then God kind of, God summons Moses and Moses actually like us, like goes into the cloud and ascends to the top of the mountain um, where they have a little conversation and Moses or God warns Moses, don't let the people cross like the threshold of the mountain. And Moses is like, I told them not to. And I'm thinking to myself, if I am one of the people and Moses already told me not to step on the mountain, I'm not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's scary. Yeah, Clay? <laughs> um, the notes in my book use a word that I haven't seen before. Uh-huh. Um, theophany. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. And that means the setup to get ready to meet God. Mm-hmm. So there's your earthquake, your fire, you know, the whole mm -hmm. deal. They use that word, which I had not encountered. I could tell kind of what it would mean with the Theo, but I had yeah. never seen that word before. And that's the term they use mm -hmm. for all the setup to get ready to meet a deity. Clay, would you spell that word? T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. So yeah. when Chris said the word cacophony, uh -huh. and then my book's got theophany, <laughs> you know, so it's the, uh, yeah, yeah, that idea. So the but suffix religious. is, the suffix is the same as like epiphany, which is mm -hmm. like the arrival of a thought. Mm -hmm. It's like the, think of it as instead of like an idea coming, it's like the theophany is like the God coming. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is the I encounter. could figure that part out, but I just had never encountered this word before. So just thought mm -hmm. I would uh, bring it up as the description. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I'm wondering what the purpose or the function is of having of if you touch the bottom of the mountain, you will die. What what's the purpose of that? I don't understand why that's a rule. That is remember we talked about like the the impurity of just being human we're not perfect we're not divine and so that's kind of the threshold of where god's divinity will kind of exterminate the people so it's one of those that if you are not of a certain um excuse me moses kind of has this elevated status where he is for lack of a better term holier than thou he has yeah. this elevated holy status, which means that he can interact with divinity and not be and not die because of it. We so will it see starts with the mountain. It starts with the foot of the mountain, the actual mountain itself. Yeah, that's kind of the the threshold where that's gonna come into play, where like the divinity can't even touch humanness. And the thought with the kind of the Lord and the host, the 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 host and everything with it is that God has protectors and that if the humans get too close, they will kind of be eliminated to protect God as well. That we don't want to contaminate God's holiness as well. So I, this isn't seen as like God being persnickety. This is actually for like the safety of the humans. Humans don't touch God. It's like in the same way of like, don't touch a hot stove. That's a bad idea. This is the deity equivalent of don't touch the hot stove. 
So God is no longer walking around in the garden and chatting with people. Correct. <laughs> yes. And this is why often when they talk in like Genesis, when it seemed like God was kind of like walking around and like talking to Abraham about to go to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, it is seen as the angels going around the messengers of God with God's voice kind of like talking through them. They, oh. they are almost like an avatar of God. This is God's actual presence. This is also where we get ideas of, um, if you've heard this, I actually don't know where this started, but the Metatron is the voice of God, which is seen to be a specific angel that like channels the voice of God. So like people's faces don't get blown off when God talks. And that may come from Dante's Inferno. I am not positive, but it works its way somewhere in Christian thinking that there is like a specific angel that like has the voice of God. So people don't get blown to pieces when they hear God's voice. People have been thinking about this for a long time. <laughs> Anyways. So, um, so the in 21, the instruction is, once again, go down and warn the people not to break through. Otherwise, they will perish. Like, God's actually very concerned with the people not perishing. Like, I want to come and greet you all, but I don't want you to die. Um, so, but then even the priest who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves. This is a little bit anachronistic because the priests have not yet been chosen. So this is kind of where we see a little muddling of the text, but for even the priest will have to be like ex especially consecrated. So they're a little bit holier. So they're not blown to pieces by God's holiness. Um, but then Moses assures the Lord that the people are not permitted because we listened to your warnings. We listened to you. They're not going to come on the mountain. We will keep this a holy place. And that's when God gives the instructions. Go bring up, go, go down, bring up Aaron, um, and don't let the priest or the people break through. So God has descended. God is now talking one-on-one -on -one with Moses, but now it's time to go get Aaron and bring him into the conversation as well. So this is where the story wraps up for today. What are your all's final thoughts? I want to know what he wants Aaron for. Mm, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Aaron's going to be, does Aaron actually speak the Ten Commandments <laughs> or does Moses do it? Uh, if you have seen the movie, you may know the role Aaron plays, but... Um, Oh, uh, there, he he does have a purpose of why he's on the mountain. We just okay. haven't gotten to it. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? Nope. All righty. Well, we can call it a day. Next week, it is exciting. We get to actually talk about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the thing I would encourage you all to do, if you want just a little bit of extra fun, is if you get, like, go to, there's, like, find the Ten Commandments online, but take out the numbers of, like, the verses eliminate the spaces and just have it as a block of text and break up where you think the different commandments are because i'm going to tell you this ahead of time there is not agreement on what on how to break up this text because if you remember hebrew comes in a block it doesn't have line breaks originally it doesn't have verse numbers and so there is active dispute over what the 10 actually are it's called that in other places of scripture so we do know that there are 10 commandments theoretically but what they are specifically is in question so if you want a little extra front print it out or but like eliminate the verse numbers and eliminate the line breaks and see what you think the 10 commandments are <laughs> I, 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 I forgot which one it is 
the Oxford RSV mm -hmm. has has a diagram of the of the, the let's see uh, the Jewish breaking out the mm -hmm. Orthodox and Protestant and Anglican and the Roman Catholic and Lutheran. There's yep. two different breaks, yeah. So yep. I don't have to do it. It's all there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mary Ellen. <clears throat> I don't have a printer. And I was wondering if maybe you could do that on the computer and send it to us as an email and let us play with that. Oh, I can certainly do that. That's actually really easy. All right. So I'll I'll take out the numbers and the spaces and send it to you all as a block of text. And Great. you all get to decide where it is because it's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think would be interesting is if you were going to make 10 rules of living. Is there anything that you would add? Is there anything that you think is so important? It should be in the 10, even if it's not. <laughs> oh. okay. So you actually have homework this time. Um, a little see. bit of a heads up of what's coming up in some weeks to come, because uh, we are going to be getting a, the text is shifting, if you can't tell, like this whole theophany is setting up what is people would think of as a lot of Levitical law, uh, the how you, they talk about the the rules of the covenant, the like actual specifics of it. That actually starts now, and so pay attention to the Northminster notes because there are going to be chapters coming up that they are long. But I don't think we want to slog through it one by one. So I have grouped some of the chapters together and it will be a lot of reading, but trust me, it will go faster if we group some of these together because I don't think we want to talk about this, the actual measurements of the temple for five weeks. <laughs> so yeah. I know it's gonna be a slog for some of this, but I will try to pull out the interesting information. Um, and just look at some of the groupings. It, some of these passages are going to be on the longer end, but it's just so we can get through these, the, a good amount of information. All right? Okay. All righty. So with that, can I pray us out for today? Thank you. <laughs> Holy God. <laughs> As we read about the people consecrating themselves to meet you, we both know that you are holy and magnificent and beyond us, but we also trust that you are eminent and close and within our grasp. And we give you thanks today that you can be both, that you can be eminent and transcendent you can be holy and magnificent, and you can also be as close to us as the breath inside our lungs. Sometimes we need you to be that personal, ever-present God that is close to our fingers, and sometimes we need the, the moments where we step back in awe of all that you are, wondering at all the things you do and just in awe of your presence. So help us keep both of these in mind and in our lives, that we do set aside time in our life to dress ourselves up, to consecrate ourselves, to make ourselves holy in order to be with you, that we remember that you are special, that you are, that your holiness and your presence means so much and goes so far beyond our experience. But also help us trust that you are always ever so close, that you are with us no matter what, in our waking and in our sleeping, in our highs and in our lows. And we thank you that you live in this con contradiction now and always. So we give you thanks for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah. Hey, Larry, you got to see you at lunch? Yep. See you then.